I started at XCOR in approximately June of 2008. Um, I made the decision to come to XCOR a little earlier, but uh, it was uh, one of those places where I come from a, a, a f industry and a firm that uh, uh, you know typically takes a little bit to separate from. And uh, uh, it's you know, I came from uh, Morgan Stanley and uh, Wall Street. So you know, want to make sure that your clients are treated the right way, and, and you know, you hand things off appropriately, and uh, and whatnot. And so it, it took a couple months, three months to, to move, but finally finally showed up. And your background at Ford, uh, what were you doing at Morgan Stanley? Yeah, I was uh, prior to prior to uh, coming to XCOR, uh, I spent about eight and a half years, nine years uh, working for first Lehman Brothers and then Morgan Stanley. Uh, I served in their wealth management the division, which put in a relationship role where I worked with uh, certain clients that also had uh, um, anticipated banking needs. So um, I can't talk a lot about them, obviously, uh, private clients, but uh, uh, it wasn't just your traditional sort of uh, slinging stocks role. So it was much more involved. Too. And what led you to get involved with XCorp? Oh well, I, I'd been uh, yeah prior to well prior to prior to Lehman, I uh, uh, I'd been in the aerospace world for about 15 years. So I started life as an electrical engineer, studied uh, avionics and antenna theory, um, worked on some of the very very early GPS equipment. Uh, I think in 1982 we were working on a I, don't, I think it was Trimble. It was like serial number 001 of <laughs> receivers. 19 inch rack that big for that was the receiver and then the computer that ran it was another 19 inch rack and now they're in your watch you know it's just amazing um, and uh, so I was in the GPS world uh, for many years um, down at Cape Canaveral I worked after undergrad and then I worked for the MITRE Corporation Did a lot of avionics uh, work international civil aviation organization standards helped develop some receivers that went into some military planes and and then um, got hired by Booz Allen in Hamilton and worked a number of years, about nine years for Booz, uh, some of it overseas. And then uh, went back to grad school at MIT and, um, for my MBA and then went on. Uh, but the way I found XCOR, um, I was helping uh, uh, a CEO uh, who was a client um, who had a robotics company. And uh, he had an investor who, um, was uh, 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 also invested in XCOR. And he said, you know, I got this guy and he's really enthusiastic about this company. He used to be in the aerospace world. Maybe you can help him. It's all about this new commercial aerospace. Oh, no. Oh, no. So uh, I met the gentleman over the phone and asked him some hard questions and he seemed to have the right answers. And I said, well, okay. So I met the company, it was XCOR. And I eventually helped, uh, uh, I invested in the company with a couple other folks from, uh, the Boston Harbor Angels, which was an angel group I was a member of. And that's how I got to know the company, was I put my money where my mouth was and invested in them. So. And, and then how did you come to make a, the decision to actually join the company full time? Well, um, you know, I was closely tracking the milestones that they laid out. Um, you know, are they really hitting them? Uh, are they raising the money they said they needed to raise? Are they getting the contracts they said they could? You know, what you normally do when you invest in a private company. Um, helping out however I can. You know, once you're fully vested, you know, you, you, you're involved. You, you want to help them out. So, uh, hey, why don't you call this person for more investment? Or, you know, maybe you can... Uh, uh, you know, get a contract with this person. Or, and so uh, uh, I got a phone call uh, from the same person who first introduced me to the company. <laughs> and he goes, uh, hey, we had to hit that big milestone. You know, the engine's fully reusable. Uh, do you think you can help us find uh, a person that can help us do A, B, C, and D? Went, sure. And they said, why don't you send me a job description? And they sent me my resume. And I went, oh, God. Literally? Yeah, well, almost. <laughs> Come on, guys. And, um, and I said, it'd be great, but I'm, you know, I've got a wife, two kids, you know, wife's in grad school, all the excuses. And, uh, and I told my wife about it, and she goes, ah, you should take the job, you're miserable. Okay. And as wives are normally, she was correct, so I joined. That was very supportive. Uh, so, so I joined. You know, she had just taken a job with a big company, and. She was doing well, so she said, it's your turn now. 
I've been I've not worked for two years. It's your turn to go make less money and and uh, and do what you really want to do and chase your dream. So it always been a dream of mine. I wanted to be an astronaut from early, early, early days. So this is a way of doing it. So now you're with X Corp. Mm -hmm. As the chief operating officer, mm -hmm. you know, where, do you, where, where do you want to take the company in the next 10 years? 10 years? 10 years. Well, I hope we're... Over the next yeah, I hope we're looking at uh, <laughs> downright close to having an orbital vehicle ready to put into, put into service. So 10 years from now, you can come back and see if I, see if I made that dream come true. So, you, so the plans go beyond somewhere. Oh, of course, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, cheap, cheap and reliable access to orbital space. Yeah, fully reasonable. Yeah, really, the what's really going to open up space to its full potential. Um, the thing that's really going to change the world, much as the internet's changed the world and created economic opportunity for everyone, for every social strata, in every corner of the world. Um, I think space can do the same thing. It can be a multi-trillion dollar marketplace if you solve uh, the infrastructure backbone problem, which is the same problem they had when they were trying to implement the early internet. It just wasn't enough fiber optic cable running around the world or appropriate transmission media you know, to get all that data that people wanted to share or put out there, uh, or applications to overlay the backbone. Um, there just wasn't a way to get to it. You know, they called it the last mile problem. Well, it, it got soft. And, uh, the launch access, you know, the, the access to space problem is, is very similar in my mind. It's very analogous. So if we can get costs to low Earth orbit down to a few hundred dollars per pound, where the cost truly should be, not you know, a few tens of thousands of dollars per pound, then uh, you're going to have people saying, well, gee, I can get a thousand pounds of low Earth orbit for pretty cheap. Uh, why don't we do this? Or I can get 500 pounds of low Earth orbit. To, why don't we do that? And uh, it's going to be a very different world when that happens. Yeah. Um, and I can only imagine what some of the things people will want to do. Um, but they're all going to be exciting. Um, but you can imagine uh, in the very near term, you know, 18 months from now, there can be a whole classroom full of kids you know, watching uh, live over the internet um, a data screen that they're watching lines go up and curves being created and video that's being fed and it's a rocket plane taking off and there's some acceleration curves and data being collected and chemicals are interacting. And it's not gonna be because some NASA guy did it, it's because they built that experiment. They're the ones who did it in their classroom and they're watching it happen in real time if they aren't actually there on the runway watching it. And that's gonna be so impactful and powerful. Um, now, fast forward 10 years, those same kids, you know, are now not 15, they're 25. And guess what? They've just rounded up, you know, dad and mom and aunts and uncles and whoever else would loan them $10,000. And they've just launched 500 pounds in a low Earth orbit on x course orbital vehicle. You know, and now they're demonstrating who knows what, you know. Uh, but that's, that's, the, that's the wonder of it all. The kid who was playing on the Apple you know, the first Apple II E machine one day is going to be building, building, you know, space-based solar power stations or Lynx rockets like I was.